Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Before I get started today, I'd like to say thanks to my buddy Walter for uh, breakfast this morning. Awesome breakfast, and we solved all the world's problems. Everything, everything from Congress to Iran in just two hours. So if you guys need any help out there solving world problems, get a hold of Stan and Walt. We'll be glad to tackle them. But on today's show, I wanted to explain why it's so hard for the electric utility to move the totally to totally renewable resources uh, to provide power. I'll focus here in Hawaii because it's what I know best, but also it's less complex than most of the other systems on the mainland. A lot of people are looking to Hawaii though for the examples that we'd use on our grid. Most electric utilities are over a hundred years old and are designed to push power from a generation source to the customers. Generally that source is a power plant, a hydroelectric dam, or a nuclear power plant. But today's customers are opting to install photovoltaic panels and in some cases small wind turbines to their homes and businesses to produce power while remaining connected to the public utility for added security. This causes some challenges for the grid that it was not designed to deal with. Taking power from different directions rather than pushing power from a single generation source destabilizes the currency and frequency on the grid. So for the electric company, a generation station like a power plant or a hydroelectric dam produces what's called firm power. But things like solar panels and wind turbines produce intermittent power. In other words, it goes on, off, up, down, depending on the wind and, and whether there's clouds or not. The public utility is required to give us, its customers, reliable, clean, consistent power. And they're very capable of doing that <clears throat> with their firm power generation. However, most utilities find themselves challenged managing more than, believe it or not, 15 to 20 percent of their generation when it comes from photovoltaic or wind power. So what happens when the utility has to accept more intermittent power than it can manage, which is right now in Hawaii we're pretty well saturated at about 18 percent. They stop allowing any more wind or solar on the grid unless they can control, control it at the source. In other words, at your house. So often when you hear the public utility talk about upgrading you to a smart grid, they're talking about the ability to turn off some of your appliances, like a water heater, when there's too much demand for power on their system, and then turning it back on when the demand decreases. <clears throat> In the case of solar and wind, a smart grid also usually entails controlling your inverters, so that if you're pushing too much power to the grid, they can actually cut off the power, the flow of power from your house back into the grid. They also would use this, this uh, system at the inverters to make sure that they shut you off if there's a power outage so that you don't activate their, their system while their guys are working to restore power for the rest of the grid. If the rate structure in your area lets the utility buy any of your surplus power and you never need energy from the utility, you could actually be making money. But if you do not have control of your own power generation, you may end up throwing away power that they can't use. Now this may be okay if it's only a short interruption in your personal system, but if the utility refuses to take the power from your solar panels or your wind turbines for extended periods, the power they refuse to buy could be a significant amount of money. This is what's commonly referred to as curtailment. The smart grid, from their perspective, continues to give them the control and make sure that the electric company's stockholders maintain a profit. So what are some of the things that utilities should be considering that precious, precious few are looking at like, uh, to, to control this, their grid in the future? Things like efficiency and using renewable resources of all the renewable resources available. What about storing energy? and traditionally was stored on the, on the island in the form of oil or coal that won't be available when you're all on renewables. What about the increased demand for electricity as we all try to de decarbonize transportation? You know, here in Hawaii, our electric grid only uses about half of the energy that we use in the state. The rest is transportation. Can you imagine doubling the electric load on the, on the state's infrastructure all, of, all at once or over the next couple of years? The most critical thing that the utility should look at is modifying their existing grid by dividing it into multiple smaller grids that are easier to manage, particularly if they're grouped by user type and location. 
This offers several opportunities to, uh, to address efficiency, storage, and transportation. For example, a residential community with a lot of houses producing clean solar or wind use a little bit of power in the morning, generally a whole lot of power that is generated by their solar in the, in the afternoon is not used. And then as the sun goes down, the residential community starts using more power than the solar and the wind can produce. At night when there's no solar at all, the people are on, on their own and the people are on their computers watching TV, doing dishes and using a lot of electricity. And there's no power being produced by their panels until maybe 10 or 11 at night, and the power requirements slowly taper off for the grid. Some houses may even need to buy power from the utility if they can't store it somehow from their solar panels during the day. This residential cycle is often referred to as a duck curve, and generally the utility's entire power cycle looks like the residential duck curve. But because residential areas also don't have many power requirements that make large shock loads like big motors, running compressors, or large air conditioning systems, or maybe even things like blast furnaces, they're more efficient and they, they're a bit less complex. So if the utility did some analysis of their customers, it could divide their customers up into geographic groups that would be easier to manage because their loads are more predictable. They use less com complex infrastructure and they could accept more intermittent renewables if they organize these communities to operate as what we now call a microgrid. These microgrids uh, wouldn't just be easier to manage. They're also uh, more reasons, like efficiency survivability and survivability after disasters, man-made or natural disasters. From an efficiency perspective, because the utility has to provide high-quality power without interruption or degradation, it always keeps extra generators online and running, but not pushing any power out or not pushing much power out. So they can instantly react to a surge requirement on the grid. This means that the electric company is producing power and throwing it away 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. And they're usually doing so with generators that are running at their least efficient operating range when they're just spinning. Just in, that's a just-in-case scenario, in case they need have a sudden need for power. This costs the utility a significant amount of money, particularly if they're burning fossil fuel to keep those generators online at their most inefficient rate. An alternative that is rarely recognized to serve in this role is the modern flywheel. <clears throat> the flywheels are, are rare in large grids. However, in microgrids, spinning a flywheel or several spinning flywheels could provide all of the spinning reserve required on that entire microgrid using very little fuel or energy to keep them up and spinning. It's a matter of scale. Flywheels aren't ever considered for large grids because they do not scale up well. But in a microgrid, they make a lot of sense. In fact, I talked to some of my electrical engineering friends after they really got to understand flywheels, and they, the light bulb came on and they said, this is stand, the ultimate spinning reserve, no pun intended. Flywheels are just a big heavy weight spinning on zero friction bearings. When you need power, you can instantly connect them to a generator. Other, another large inefficiency that exists in the current grid design is the fact that power is pushed long distances at high voltages through power lines. This requires transformers and substations to increase and decrease the voltage and stabilize power along the route. And your electrical engineer will tell you that there's resistance whenever you send electricity through a wire. And that's why you can't simply string hundreds of yards of extension cords together without causing a problem like losing voltage or possibly even starting a fire. <clears throat> you have to have the right size wires and the correct voltage when you're pushing power through hundreds or thousands of miles of wire in a grid. The longer you pull the wire, the more power you lose. This is typically called line loss. So when we take communities of geographical locations and size and size them properly, we can avoid a great deal of the line loss and we can store more intermittent renewable energy in the same location where it's produced on those solar panels from your roof for use at a later time. We could be absorbing any extra intermittent renewable surplus energy that would normally be curtailed. So how might this work? So say, for example, you had a community with four or 500 homes. You could put between 
10 and 20 uh, panels on the typical roof, which would be between about 3 kilowatts and 6 kilowatts of production on any household roof. Hopefully facing the south so you get the max exposure in the northern hemisphere. And they would generate all the power that a house would need in a 24-hour period over a typical day. Here, we use between three and five hours of quote-unquote rated production per solar panel per day as a rule of thumb. So we're looking at between maybe uh, 30 and, let's say, six, so, uh, 30 and 70, 80 kilowatt hours average daily for the, the panels that would fit on the house. And that, that electrical power produced per day would give you enough to cover what you use and a little bit more. You can get your actual usage off of your electric bill. My house, for example, uses between 19 and 20, 22 kilowatt hours per day. I have no air conditioning. I have an electric clothes dryer, enough electric water heater, and electric range and oven. And so even with all those electric hydroelectric appliances, I only use an average of about 20 kilowatt hours a day or 21 kilowatt hours. Here in Hawaii, because we're closer to the equator than most of the rest of the U.S., we actually can count on between five and a half and six hours of rated power from our solar panels, unless our house is in a valley or have large trees around it uh, or something else that's blocking the sun from your, your solar panels. And you may also live in an area that's known to be cloudy a lot of the day because of the constant weather pattern, uh, like in Manoa here in Hawaii. Most houses in our notional microgrid would use about 70 to 80 percent of their power, so you'd have a little bit of a buffer there. And they, they, uh, the power that they produce may be capable of even more surplus. Any surplus power that you produce could be stored in batteries for nighttime and rainy days, or put in long-term storage such as hydrogen, or maybe even those flywheels we talked about earlier. The discussion on hydrogen for long-term storage as opposed to batteries is going to be a subject of another show. But in short, batteries are important for helping us balance our home power at changes, as it changes and smoothing out that power and also gets us through the night when the sun's not shining on our solar panels. Batteries tend to work efficiently for short duration outages and lower power requirements, but hydrogen is more economical at larger scale and longer duration storage such as days, weeks, or even longer. In a microgrid, hydrogen would function as a long duration power storage but it could also be used for heating or cooking because it's flammable. You can actually use it in your clothes dryer, your water heater, or cooking uh, if you need to. You just have to change the burner a little bit. So what might your microgrid look, area look like? The 500 houses with solar panels on all the roofs may even have some wind turbines out there with them. If they're set in a significant wind zone uh, in, that, in that area, each house with a, a bank of batteries would be able to store enough energy to carry it through the night and through maybe part of another day. If it's cloudy or rainy and the batteries don't get charged all the way, you still would be good for a 24-hour period. Anytime the solar panels are producing excess power, that electricity is sent to an electrolyzer once the batteries are charged, and that electrolyzer produces hydrogen gas. And that gas may be sold to the gas utility or stored in the house for other uses. Besides making pure oxygen gas, that electrolyzer also makes pure hydrogen, makes pure oxygen, and it also gives off some heat. If this oxygen and heat are collected for the community to use, the oxygen can be sold for medical or industrial use, or other things like aquaculture, and even heat, the heat can be used to heat water uh, in your house or make more electricity. The hydrogen could be used in, in a fuel cell to make the power needed to charge your batteries from your own house, for example, or uh, any long duration power sh uh, shortages could be right there in handy to run your house and recharge your batteries off of your own fuel cell. There's no need to be tied to the grid at all if you have this kind of long term storage. Hydrogen can be pushed into a large fuel cell and provide electricity for that entire microgrid or a small fuel cell or even a car to provide electricity from the home. From your car, can you believe that you could actually run just as an example, a Toyota Mirai has a 114 kilowatt fuel cell. It has way more power than you need to run your house. You, if you could take the power from the car and turn it into uh, power for your house, you'd be all set. 
We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in 60 seconds, and we'll talk a little bit more about this notional micro. Hey, aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us, and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you. and. Uh, Aloha. So when we left before break, we were talking a little bit about getting power from your car, but there's actually so many things that you can use hydrogen for at home for backup energy uh, power for your bat to, to charge your batteries, the power for your car to cooking to your appliances. And it's also very easy to move. And if you sold the, the excess hydrogen you're making to somebody like the gas company to store it, then they could provide you with very inexpensive plastic tubing that could bring the hydrogen right back to your house to use for cooking if you're not storing it right there on your own property with your own storage tanks. So it's really a versatile, versatile thing. And maybe we can talk more about the perfect home storage for hydrogen in some future show. But if you want to take this concept even further, you put a few more solar panels on your house than you need, and you could have the fuel for your house, for your hybrid car that uses hydrogen in, their, in its fuel cell, to, to get everything down. Just imagine clean, reliable power for your house, carbon-free, and fuel for your car at the same time. Now, another uh, shortcoming that I was thinking about as we, as we talked about transforming the new grid, I can tell you that as a former general in the National Guard, I have quite a bit of formal training and experience in responding to large-scale natural disasters. And I can tell you that even during major disasters, there are always pockets of a region that aren't totally devastated in the disaster, unless it's a of a cataclysmic scale. So if you have communities that are, that are resilient and they're not touched by these disasters, they can fully function and provide the power and refrigeration and cooking gas in the form of hydrogen and things like ice and oxygen for hospitals while well, the hard-hit communities are focusing on recovery. So the picture I'm trying to paint here is not, it's not just an efficiency thing, it's also highly practical in a world that is constantly thrown, nat throwing natural disasters our way. I mentioned briefly the hydrogen-powered cars, and that brings up a, a critical point. If we're truly going to remove fossil fuels from our energy portfolio in our state, that means our grid will nearly have to double in size to accommodate the electrical needs for our vehicles, including our new rail, large trucks, and large buses. Especially if the vehicles travel long distances or up hills, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles always beat batteries. Future transportation will not be powered by batteries alone. There will be hydro vehicles that have, have to have some form of energy storage other than batteries to provide the kind of performance that we are used to, like hundreds of miles of range, or being able to fill up just once a week or so. In this case, hydrogen fuel and fuel cell vehicles are vital to get the range and performance needed, especially in large vehicles and buses. But it also makes typical passenger car transportation much more available from clean, renewable photovoltaic and wind power. And if you're under the impression that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are someplace far in the future, then you need to understand that today there are over 6,000 hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicles operating in California alone, and the thousands of vehicles in Europe and Asia as well. Toyota, Honda, and Hyundai are just three of the companies that are all producing, not prototyping, producing hydrogen powered vehicles and selling them. 80% of all the car manufacturers on the planet are planning to produce hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, many of them by 2025. These are not prototypes, they are production vehicles that would be on your streets today 
if the hydrogen stations were available. Currently, California is the only state in the U.S. that has incentivized construction of trans transportation hydrogen stations and has nearly 50 built statewide. But that's a discussion for another time. There's a few states on the East Coast that are also starting to build stations. In Asia and Europe, the stations are already on the streets and they already have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So what I'd like to do now is throw in uh, a video here that talks a little bit about microgrids, just so you can get a better picture of what microgrids can really do. That says it probably in a more concise way than I have. So we're gonna watch the video. There are over 300 million people in our country and the vast majority rely on large scale centralized power grids for their energy. But the infrastructure is aging and it is vulnerable. Natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave large swaths of the country without power. Fortunately, there is an alternative. A renewable energy microgrid represents a different path for the future. Renewable microgrids generate power from sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, waste to energy, and geothermal. That power can be stored within the localized system using technologies such as advanced batteries, hydrogen, flywheels, pumped hydro, and others. These microgrids can provide reliable and efficient energy transmission, especially to critical facilities like hospitals, airports, and military bases. Unlike our current large-scale systems, microgrids eliminate single points of failure and are therefore more resilient to disasters, threats, and power outages. Our current energy infrastructure loses a lot of money. Grid outages cost up to $33 billion annually. They are expensive to build, expand, and maintain. And they're inefficient, losing more than half of the initial energy to factors such as line loss, spending reserves, and theft. Microgrids solve these issues and greatly reduce transmission loss and maximize efficiency. They also reduce carbon emissions and eliminate imported fuel costs keeping money within our local economy, and even create new local industries and jobs based on clean, renewable energy. Our energy grid was built over 100 years ago, when energy needs were simple, with the increased complexities of energy demands, power sources, and transportation. Now our old grid struggled to keep up. We require new ways to generate, store, and deliver energy. Renewable energy microgrids are a potential long-term solution that will provide safe, clean, reliable, and efficient energy for generations to come. So that video gives you a really good bird's eye view of uh, some of the advantages to a microgrid, but really it's hard to get a public utility to change its spot, so to speak, when it's been working 100 years with the same model. They want to keep controlling. They want to have control from their end. And so for some insight as to why microgrids and distributed generation are critical, the addition of renewable to the addition of renewable energy to everyone's energy portfolio, you just have to understand they have to redesign the grid. We won't be able to divest ourselves of fossil fuels efficiently without reconfiguring our existing grids taking advantage of the technologies that make microgrids and hydrogen energy storage possible. So something that I've been talking to some local companies about is actually making a um, community, a uh, residential community from scratch. It has the ability to not only produce hydrogen at the household level, but produce hydrogen at the household level, send it back to a storage maybe contractor or maybe Hawaii Gas or some other utility, store it, and that would be the backup power for the house. It would be the cooking uh, gas for cooking, water heating, and um, clothes dryers. And then it would be a non-wired uh, backup electrical system for your community. And as I said, the cars that are coming out now, a lot of them don't allow you to actually export power from the car to a house. And that I've talked to the manufacturers, and they said that's strictly a cost-cutting uh, reason. It, it adds a lot of cost to the house, and they're already uh, on real tight margins making these first fuel cell vehicles and getting them out for people to buy. 
But eventually, you should be able to take the, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and actually use them like a power source to turn hydrogen back into electric power for your house. So you could take your car, put hydrogen in it from your own storage tanks or from a system that's, that's supplying hydrogen from a central storage location directly to your house in underground buried um, tubes that are put in the ground the same time they put in your water lines or anything else and or your uh, fiber cable whatever and those lines are small they're all made of reinforced plastic tubing and they can come right to your house provide hydrogen so you basically have uh, no connection to the grid and no reason to go to a gas station to get gas in your car because your house would be producing everything that you need for power at home for your for your electrical appliances and also the fuel for your car it's really a neat concept but it's not pie in the sky. It's things that are happening uh, every day now. In fact, well, one guest that I have on you uh, regularly is uh, Mike Stritsky from New Jersey, runs a project called Hydrogen House. You can look that up online, Hydrogen House uh, uh, New Jersey. And he has a couple of examples of how he takes his house completely off the grid uh, with just solar panels. And he lives in the Northeast. So he makes all of his hydrogen that he needs for the year just in the summertime off of his solar panels. And he stores the hydrogen at low pressure and only and, and he uses propane tanks for that. So it's only 250 pounds per square inch pressure and not the typical hydrogen pressures which we use in vehicles, which are 5,000 or 10,000 PSI. So there's so many things to look forward to in the not too distant future that will bring us clean, good, solid power. And hydrogen stored in tanks or brought, brought through a pipe system it's just like the baseload power that the utility gets off of its big turbines and generators. It's solid, firm power. So it's not intermittent like we get off the of solar panels and off of wind turbines. So you're basically taking that intermittent power and turning it into firm power for your grid. And if you do that, you can basically run your own grid on your own house. So I hope that gives you a better understanding of what the public utility has to deal with in running their grid day to day and how we can really take that utility, restructure its business model, so it's the power, um, the power uh, provider or the, po the power system main maintainer for big subdivisions or large areas that want to be off the grid. They could be the folks that come out and repair your equipment and help your system keep up to speed and spend less time working on down power lines during storm. I hope that works for you. I hope you get a little bit out of that, and I'll be looking to see you next week. I'll be broadcasting from the Big Island, probably from Blue Planet Research, and talking about electrolyzers that can pressurize off the stack and give us some of that uh, money back that we normally spend on compressors. So until next week, Santa Energy Man signing off. Aloha.